36 and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to start at verse 17 and I'm going to actually read what's going on. And in verse 17, this is the English Standard Version I'm reading from. You guys have the NIV, but if you can follow on, it says, But in the following instructions, I do, that is, I, Paul, do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So let's just set context up here a little bit. Honestly, what's happening here? You see, in the, we've been talking about the book of Acts lately. Paul, Pastor Moore's been going through that. And in the book of Acts, earlier on in Acts, you have people who are joining in communion with each other and proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes and all this great stuff. But then all of a sudden you hear about this stuff through Paul about how people are divided and it's getting so bad that at a supposed communion service, he's claiming they're not, even though they claiming that they probably claim that they are. Um, he's claiming that people are getting drunk. Now, the reason for that probably, historically, I looked into this, is because uh, the poor people, the poor, those who had nothing, had to work their job harder into the night. So they would start reclining at night. They would have their meal. It would be within the context of, the, of communion. And the poor people would come in later, but what would happen before that? The people would both eat and then get drunk off of wine or whatever they had. So in other, they didn't eat in communion with each other. They, and, and, and the rich basically were there already, most likely, and they were getting what they want. They were getting their fill. The, 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 the poor people would come in later and they wouldn't get their fill. There was a division that was happening within the church. It sounds a lot different from Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, you have breaking of bread, things in common, people working in the spirit, people proclaiming, people praying together. In this instance, you have division. Community and unity in Acts 2, division in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now let's go on. It says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, you wonder, what does this have to do with the preceding verse? What does this have to do with that? There's division happening. There's favoritism happening. There's richer people who were getting their fill and getting drunk and humiliating the church of God in doing so because it's not even considered by Paul to be real communion anymore. And then he starts talking about this tradition that was handed on to him from the other apostles about communion. Well, here's how they connect. Let's go to verse 27. The answer is right there. It says in verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Now, it says in your bulletin, the title of the sermon is, Are You Worthy? Well, John Wesley himself actually made it quite clear that none of, none of us are actually naturally worthy. We aren't. We're not worthy. None of us are worthy in, the, in our essence. But we're still worth it to God to die for us who aren't worthy because he died for us while we are still sinners. All right? And... Even though we are, we, we are unworthy, he still died for us. And, and, and the thing is, though, in here, we're talk, when we talk about communion, and when we talk about proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, 
That's what wasn't happening at all. In fact, because they were getting drunk, because they were showing favoritism, because there was division, that was, they weren't proclaiming the Lord's death. They were proclaiming what they wanted, what they desired. What, and, and they were just living naturally. They weren't living as they were supposed to in the Lord. See, in the Corinthian manner, the, what I'm talking about is to, to, to take the Lord's Supper in a manner that's unworthy of Him. In this context is what I call the Corinthian manner, and that is a division of body. Now, if you notice, going back up, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks a cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. How are you, how are you going to be claimed, how are you going to be claimed to be a Christian having accepted the body and blood of the Lord in that, and what that actually um, does for you and then you're claimed by Paul to be people who are guilty of the same things the Romans and the Jews did to him on the cross. So Paul says elsewhere that we're not, we don't live under condemnation. We don't live under judgment anymore. But Paul here is saying that these Christians in Corinth, in Corinth did. They were living in judgment. And it got so bad that they became ill. People started getting ill. And they started being judged by God for taking the, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. But how can you be guilty of that? And how does that, you know, how can you be guilty of that when you claim to be a Christian? Let me show you how the guilt actually runs its course. How this actually makes sense. If you rip up a picture of your dad or your mom, your spouse... What does that say about the heart condition of where you are in relation to that person? I have never seen a person take a picture of someone that they love and rip it up. That picture is a symbol of that person, right? And rip it up at the, while at the same time saying, I love them or I care about them. That doesn't make sense. They are using, they, they rip up that picture. That means there's something going on in their heart. Right? Well, when Jesus talked about the heart in the Sermon on the Mount, he actually made it quite clear that if you are guilty, if you hate your brother, you are guilty of murder. Now people say, well, how can you be guilty? There's first degree murder, there's second degree murder. We all agree on the idea that you, if you don't actually kill someone, you're not as guilty. That's the way we think. But the point that Jesus was pointing to is the heart. His whole message dealt with the inner core of a human being. And therefore, that's going to literally affect the way we take the Lord's Supper. He expects full heart submission to the Lord. And that literally affects the way we have full heart submission in relation to the church. See, it says going on in verse 28, Let a person examine themselves then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Without discerning the body. If you talk to a Roman Catholic about what that means, they'll say, well, the context is there. It's easy. You look at Paul's handing on of tradition. It's talking about the elements within the Lord's Supper. So when you say it says discerning the body and blood, it's talking about the actual body and blood of the Lord in the elements. Well, the problem is they're going, they don't understand the overall arching context, and that is the body of Christ, which is spoken about starting at verse 17. The context isn't just what was handed on to Paul. The context is also what was happening within the church, and that's Paul's argument. When it says, whoever uh, let a person examine himself, and for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on themselves, the body we're talking about is the body of Christ. Because when the people were divided, okay, they were separating themselves by means of sin, favoritism, people getting drunk, there was separation, there was literally a tearing away of the body. And what is the church? It's the body of Christ. 
This is, what, this is the way we are to view. The church is literally the body of Christ. And if you want to understand the heart level of the Saul, it goes down to your very speech. If you don't want to, if there's separation between the body, it happens not just in actions, not just in drunkenness, not just the way the Corinthians were doing it. It happens by means of speech. It happens by means of where your heart level is. Okay? Go back to the picture analogy that I gave. And your heart level is important. And you see that, um, let's, let, let, let's go to words, for example. You're, anyone ever use sarcasm? Yeah. Right? Sarcasm's a funny way of, of, of humor, okay? Sarcasm can be biting, though. There's a good side of sarcasm. There's a bad side of sarcasm. You've got to really be mature to be able to handle it well. But at, you, you want to know what the Greek word actually means? Sarcosmos. Sarkos is the word that means flesh. Sarcosmos comes from a Greek word that literally means, it's an action word that means a ripping or tearing off of the flesh. The original context of the word sarcasm referred to ripping flesh. That's what was going on here. Now, there wasn't, I'm not saying there's sarcasm going on here, sarcastic humor, but literally the body of Christ who is married to Jesus Christ is of one flesh by means of that marriage. And what these people were doing is they were dividing. Therefore, the body itself, the flesh, was being ripped. The word sarcasm, in a, in a humorous context, I, I just explained that. But here, there's a literal ripping of the flesh. There's a literal ripping of two beings that are supposed to be united, or one being that's supposed to be united, because that being is, is attached to Jesus Christ. Okay? So, if you would understand that the body of Christ, here, you were guilty of the blood, the shed blood, and the broken body of Christ by means of dividing. So if you divide, if you rip up the picture of, and we are the picture of Christ. If you rip up that picture and divide that church, you're guilty in the heart of a division between the spouse and her husband, and between the within the spouse herself. That division is horrid. That's why these people were being judged because what G, what God was essentially saying is these people aren't taking this seriously enough. I died for them, and now they're taking what they are supposed to live out in and dividing it. And in the heart, they are guilty of the same thing that Jesus... They are guilty of what the Romans and the Jews did. They ripped apart the body of Christ. Now the body of Christ, which is the church, is ripping itself apart. That is horrible. See, the Lord's Supper is not just a symbol. The Lord's Supper attaches itself to what it proclaims. The Lord, we, just don't pro, we don't just proclaim something in symbolic form because we as a community are attached to that symbol. Okay? And if you understand these verses within context, you realize that the proclamation of the Lord's Supper, what we proclaim, literally changes and should change the way we practice. And if it doesn't, and if there's division and not unity, then we're doing the same thing the Corinthians did. We're guilty at heart of ripping apart the picture God has set before humanity of his unity. So, discerning the church is important. Now, you've probably heard preachers talk about, you know, make sure you look at yourself Make sure you understand where you are in the Lord before you take, take uh, the Lord's Supper. Don't take it in an unworthy manner. Well, at the end of the day, the reason you're doing that is because you're supposed to not just look at yourself. You're looking at every one of the body. You're discerning the rest of the body. We take in communion with each other because it is what it is called. It's called communion. 
In verse 30 it says, That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. These people in Corinth wouldn't have been judged because if they had not done what they had done, they wouldn't have divided the body. They wouldn't have ripped the picture and therefore shown themselves to, to, to be symbolically ripping apart the body of Christ itself. Their guilt wouldn't have been there if they would have judged themselves as doing this in the first place. Let me ask you guys as you take the Lord's Supper today, are you willing to discern the rest of the body? Are you willing to look at yourself and look at the rest of the people so that when you take the Lord's Supper today, you don't take it in an unworthy manner? That is in a manner that is in a, the unworthy manner here would be simply division and sin between each other. Because if you don't, if you do take the Lord's, if you make that proclamation today in the Lord's Supper, and yet you take it in an unworthy manner, you and I are guilty of literally <laughs> taking the whips and doing the same thing the Romans did and doing the same thing the Jews did by conspiring against him. We are those who proclaim to accept what Jesus did for us on the cross, not those who did that to him on the cross. That's our proclamation, and it affects the way we live. So today, take this in a worthy manner. That is, in a manner where you're serious about what the church proclaims, what the church's mission is, and the fact that we no longer actually live in divisive sin. We literally live in love. So, when... <clears throat> Did you take it in a worthy manner or an unworthy manner? Is your heart divided or is it whole? When you go home today, are you going to be divided from other human beings because of sin? Or are you going to be seeking what Paul calls a ministry of reconciliation? Not just reconciliation with each other, but even with those who are considered your enemies. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much. For today's word, if it has reached any of our hearts, we ask that we live it out after we leave today. We thank you for your son's willingness to go to the cross even though he was weak, even though he sweat blood before he ever entered the cross. And we thank you that he still went through with it so that we can live whole and be a picture for you in this world and the unity that you bring between us creatures who often divide ourselves. We thank you so much. And we love you and we ask that our proclamation drives our practice. In Jesus' name, amen. The